Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Putting Your Analytics to Work. My name is Matthew McLarnan, and I am a Marketing Manager at Angos Software. Joining me for the next hour will be James Taylor, CEO of Decision Management Solutions, and Angos's Analytics Manager, Tom Zugas. So just a quick rundown of what we're going to go over in the next hour. Uh, first, I will take a moment to introduce our speakers. Then I'm going to briefly touch on the idea, on the idea of prescriptive analytics. After that, I will pass things over to our special guest, James, who's going to share his five lessons. Tom will then spend a little time showing us some practical applications of these lessons, and then we'll close out the hour with some Q&A. To most of you here, I'm sure James needs no introduction. He is the CEO and Principal Consultant of Decision Management Solutions and the leading expert in how to use business rules and analytic technology to build decision management systems. He provides strategic consulting to companies of all sizes, working with clients in all sectors to adopt decision-making technology. James has spent the last 20 years developing approaches, tools, and platforms that others can use to build more effective information systems. He's led decision management efforts for leading companies in insurance, banking, health management, and telecommunications. The best known proponent of the approach, James has helped create the emerging decision management market and is a passionate advocate of decision management. He understands how companies buy and use these technologies and has helped companies successfully adopt these technologies and apply them in the context of business process management and business intelligence initiatives. As an analytics manager at Angos, Dr. Tom Zugas is responsible for the delivery of analytics services and solutions. Tom brings more than 18 years of technical consulting experience in data analysis, system design, and software development. He's worked with clients in industries in di as diverse as financial services, insurance, software, utilities, telecom, pharmaceuticals, and metals. His role in projects has included leading project teams, defining requirements, performing feasibility studies, proof of value pilots, and applying advanced data analysis using a range of technologies and tools. Prior to joining Angos, Tom has worked as an advanced analytics consultant at IBM and SAS and managed the advanced analytics team at BlackBerry. He's also authored and taught courses in data mining. Tom holds a PhD in engineering from the University of Toronto. So there's been a lot of buzz around prescriptive analytics recently. Uh, you've likely heard a number of different definitions from different sources. Essentially, where predictive analytics asks what will happen, prescriptive analytics is an extension that asks how do we make it happen. For a little more insight, though, we spoke with our friends at Gartner, and their response was actually quite straightforward. Predictive anal sorry, prescriptive analytics is made up of two components, decision management and optimization. Of course, today we'll be focusing on the decision management piece, but in September, keep an eye open for a webcast where we'll be taking on optimization. Now I'd like to pass things over to James Taylor. Thanks very much, Matt. So let's begin by talking about decision management. As Matt says, one of the sort of key approaches that you need for adopting a more prescriptive approach to your analytics. And decision management is all about identifying, controlling, managing, and systematically improving through automation the high volume, repeatable decisions at the heart of your business, the kind of day-to-day -day transactional decisions. Taking analytics, taking business rules, taking these technologies and applying them so that you can um, make them more accurately, more precisely, more targeted decisions, make them more consistently across channels, across time. Make them more rapidly, so you can make them in real time, responding in real time to customer and other kinds of inquiries. And do all this while retaining a degree of safe business agility and ability to change those systems rapidly and reducing your costs at the same time. So decision management uh, leverages analytic technology in a very major way particularly to make these more accurate decisions uh, and to enable you to get to more rapid, more straightforward processing. And I remember what Matt said, with a lot of different companies adopting different analytic technologies, looking at decision management, and over the years there's been a handful of lessons that come up again and again that are really important if you're going to succeed with decision management and therefore with prescriptive analytics. I'm going to go through each of those lessons one at a time. So uh, we've got to focus so how you have to focus on the right kind of problem. So what is the right kind of problem for decision management? Well, the important thing is we're going to deploy an analytic model, not just build it. There's a critical aspect for many analytic practitioners, which is you've got to focus on business results, not on predictive power. And a part of that is also that you've got to think about collaboration and transparency and understanding and what that means when it comes to advanced analytics. And finally, 
in an era where we all have more and more data, if we really want to take advantage of that, we have to begin uh, solidly with the decision in mind. So I'm going to go through each of these five lessons and try and uh, give you some stories to illustrate. So the first one, and perhaps the most important, is that if you're going to apply predictive analytics, data mining, particularly if you want to apply prescriptive analytics, you've got to focus on the right kind of problem. Now, there is a tendency amongst companies, because analytics can be perceived as expensive or big data can be perceived as expensive, and because they want it to be a strategic initiative in the company, that the right place to start is by trying to use analytics to improve decision-making in the uh, executive suite. Well, but that isn't really the right place to look. The problem with the executive suite and the kind of decisions they make is there isn't a lot of data about what works and what doesn't. It's not obvious how you're going to apply analytics. And frankly, these are the people who have the most experience and the most uh, skill when it comes to decision making. And so in many ways, they're the least helped by analytics. In fact, the place you want to apply analytics, even if you want it to be a strategic initiative, is right out the front line. You want to be looking at, how do I help this call center rate? Reduce customer churn by picking the right offer for this customer. How do I reduce claims fraud, claims losses? by identifying that this claim is a fraudulent one, or that this group of people involved in this claim is actually a fraud number? How do I uh, accurately assess the risk of this particular customer so I can price the loan or credit product that they want accurately enough to make money? It is that kind of impact that predictive analytics can have, way down at the front line. And it's worth thinking, therefore, about what kinds of decisions an organization makes, because at the end of the day, analytics is all about improving decision-making. So what kind of decisions do we make? Well, we do make those big strategic decisions that we talked about. The executive suite makes those decisions. They don't make them very often, necessarily, and they tend to have a big economic impact. But they're one-off, unique decisions. Most organizations have to make a set of tactical decisions about how to run the business, how to manage and control what they're doing. Uh, what's the right staffing level, what's the right risk policy, those kinds of things. They might get done every month or every quarter, but they do repeat, but only very slightly. But you also make a huge number of these operational decisions. Should I, how do I process this claim? How do I interact with this customer? How do I price this line? These very transaction-centric, customer-centric decisions. And organizations make huge numbers of them. One bank we work with, doing next best action, added up all its customer interactions. It had 140 million customer interactions a month. That meant if you want to make a next best action decision in every transaction, well, you have to make that decision 140 million times a month. And it is these decisions, these frontline operational decisions where predictive analytics has the most impact. But that's where decision management helps, and that's where prescriptive analytics is going to get you your bang for your buck. There's lots of examples of this, and I could talk for hours about different operational decisions, but they get everywhere in an organization. You have people interacting with customers trying to price loans or find the right product or check eligibility. Those are operational decisions. When someone processes a claim and decides if you're going to write this car off as a total loss or repair it or reject the whole claim because it looks like a staged accident, that's an operational decision, a decision about a single claim that's being made. When someone's on your website and trying to defraud you by uh, using a fake ID or using fake credit cards, that too is another operational decision. Is this transaction fraudulent? One telco we work with actually used predictive analytics to route calls effectively because having identified which engineer could fix your problem and identified what the right upsell would be for you once they had fixed your problem, they then routed you to the person who was most likely to succeed not only in answering your question but also succeed in selling you the cross -sell. So using it to drive routing in a mobile, cell, a mobile telco center. And obviously things like content, web content, what should I display to this customer, all of that is an operational decision. So these operational decisions get everywhere. They may seem like they're very small, very low value decisions individually, but they have a huge cumulative impact and they are the right place to apply predictive analytics and the right place to apply prescriptive analytics. So the first lesson we've got is that if you're going to be strategic with predictive analytics and with prescriptive analytics, you've got to apply it to these operational decisions. Now, the second lesson is really a lesson for the analytic practitioners amongst you. There is a tendency sometimes to think that my job uh, as an analytic practitioner is to build the model. And it's someone else's problem to use that model to get better business results. This is not an attitude I have a lot of sympathy for. 
And the reason that is, best explained with a little story. So years ago, there was an ad campaign someone ran. I forget who it was first. And they said, those who, ran, those who know first win. And I thought that was an asinine comment. Because if here I am, I'm in company A, and I identify that a particular trend or market trend is happening and that uh, one of my products is going to be overpriced given that trend. But I do nothing about it. And meanwhile, my competitor takes a little bit longer to figure out that this is what's going on, but then gets immediately on it, changes their product pricing, and launches that new product. As far as everybody outside of the two companies is concerned, company B, the competitor, figured it out first. Because it's not about who knows first. It's about who acts first, providing, of course, that they act reasonably intelligently, that they do, in fact, apply the same quality of analytics. So knowing, simply knowing something, being able to predict something is not enough. We have to find a way to act. What that means is that deployment is essential for analytic success. And the problem with this is that analytic teams have a slight tendency to go down one of two directions. The first illustrated by an analytic team I talked to at an insurance company. I asked them what the deliverable from their analytic project was, and they said, and I quote, a 40-page report full of math. This is not a helpful deliverable. You can't really take a 40-page report full of math and do anything useful with it. It might demonstrate how clever you are and how fabulous your modeling techniques are, but it's not going to get it done. Now, the other extreme is to focus on visualization and infographics and say, oh, I'm going to produce this wonderful, pretty picture that tells you everything. But I remember talking to a company once, and they hired external consultants, and they'd come in, they'd done this data mining exercise, and they'd generated this fabulously insightful customer segmentation. And the business was absolutely excited. They thought it was the most insightful thing they'd ever heard about their customers. And when the IT guy said, well, that's great. Um, you know, show it to us, and we'll, 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 use the web, we'll get the website to treat people differently, depending on their segmentation. The business users went through this wonderful presentation of pictures and infographics. And the IT guy said, well, so that's nice. Uh, but that's what we in IT call a presentation. Uh, we need something we can run on the mainframe. Uh, what have you got? But all they had was the pretty pictures. So the whole thing had to be recoded again because neither of these organizations was really focused on how do we generate something that I can actually deploy, that I can use to run my business, to run my business systems better. And this is because what most organizations do is they take their operational systems they extract data from them into their analytic environment, and then they do analytics against it, and then they stop. They don't drive any kind of action with their analytics, and it's essential if you really want to get value from predictive analytics, and particularly if you want to move into prescriptive analytics, that you can drive back into your operational environment what those analytics mean. You have to be able to make decisions with those analytics. You have to take those analytics and embed them inside some kind of decision-making framework. And this is why decision management is such a powerful environment for getting value from analytics. You take the systems that run your business, and they can be anything. They can be legacy systems, process-based systems, mobile applications, packaged applications. At some point in their execution, they need decisions made. They need to decide how to treat a customer, whether to pay a claim, or how to price a loan, or their users do. And you want those systems to be able to reach out to some kind of service in your service oriented architecture that says, hey, Make this decision. Tell me what the right decision is and come back with an appropriate action or a set of possible actions. We call those decision services. We build those decision services by combining predictive analytics deployed into our IT infrastructure with the business rules that wrap around those analytics, apply policies, apply regulations, thresholds, cutoffs, and get all of that to work. Well, now we're driving this analytic decision-making very explicitly back into our business, and that means we can capture from all those different systems What's going on? What's working? What's not working? How are customers responding to offers? Which claims are turning out to be fraudulent later? Which loans are going bad? We can gather real business data. And it's a big data problem because these systems produce data in different formats. The call center might generate call center notes in text. The claim system might generate structured data in an environment. The web application generates web logs. All of these tell us how well our analytics are working. And we can then pull that data together, perhaps with external data to come up with new rules, new analytics, closing the loop and making this work. But we can only do all these things if we have analytics professionals who focus not just on building the model, but thinking about how it's going to be deployed. Our third lesson is very related to that, but it's really all about 
business results. There is a tendency amongst analytic professionals to rank models based on how predictive they are and, and to really aim for the most predictive thing they can find. And the problem with this is that really the predictive performance of a model, while interesting, is not in fact the critical factor. What matters is the decision performance. How well does this help me make a decision? Because if it doesn't help me make a decision better, it isn't really used to me. It can be the most predictive model possible, but if people don't use it, it doesn't add any value. Um, if I'm you know, looking to improve business results, then I need an analytic model that will help me do that. So we have to focus not on how predictive is the model, but on how effective is the model in helping me make better business decisions so that I get better business results. That means understanding what those decisions are, it means tracking their results, and it means plugging analytics into them effectively. Now, one of the things we find very effective for doing this is to describe these decisions in a modeling format. So you can say, well, here's the decision we're trying to make, and we've modeled that decision, and we use a, a new standard called the decision model and notation standard. And we can therefore say, here's exactly where the analytics is going to play a role. And that analytics is going to play this role. It's a manual decision, so we have to present the analytics to someone. It's an automated decision, so we have to embed it in a system. It's a decision that's going to be made by someone who's mobile when they make it, so it's going to run on our mobile app. All of those kinds of questions, focusing on the business results and the business outcomes. And this can be really important. If you're modeling a decision, if you look at a decision and you're already making it really accurately, then you need a very predictive model to make a difference. But if you're modeling a decision that your call center reps are making and they're frankly guessing right now, tossing a coin, then you don't need a very predictive model to make a business difference. Even a 60-40 split is better than a coin cost. And so you have to understand that decision-making context to find the right kind of models. But it is also true that once you've found the right kind of model, you've identified the right context, but how long it takes you to deploy the model matters. In analytics, time is accuracy, and accuracy is money. The more accurate the model, the better a result I'm going to get. But it has to be uh, recognized that how long it takes me to build the model and deploy the model matters because I take a snapshot of my data and then I analyze it and I build my model and then I have to deploy my model. And modern tools have reduced the time it takes me to build the model. But if I have to hand it off to IT and spend nine months while they write code implementing the model, the accuracy of that model just goes down and down as time passes. I need to deploy my models quickly and effectively so that the value the model offers to my decision making can be delivered promptly. So the third thing, Make sure you think about how you're going to generate business results from your analytics, not just analytic results. Fourth one. One of the things we have found is that uh, decision making, particularly the kind of operational decision making that really lends itself to predictive and prescriptive analytics, is an intensely collaborative exercise. In fact, the best practice we see today is that analytic teams working on an analytic problem, on day one, they have someone from the business and someone from IT immediately working with the analytics team. They don't let the analytics team go off and do some work first to see if there's anything there. It's always a collaborative effort. So you have to bring together the business, the IT environment, and the analytics team. And you think about an operational decision. It's a business decision, so you've got to have the business people because they're going to tell you what the business results are that you're looking for. You've got to have analytics people because you really want to make this in a data-driven, analytic kind of way, but it's an operational decision. It's probably high volume. It's probably embedded in a system. There's probably large amounts of data in an operational data store somewhere. So you need to engage IT to make sure that you can pull that data in and make sure that they're part of this. So you have to focus on this collaborative environment. And that creates a challenge, which is that neither the business people nor the IT people speak math the way an analytics team does. You can't just describe a model in terms of its predictive characteristics. You can't use necessarily certain kinds of modeling approaches because they create models that no one understands. And then particularly if you've got a compliance or a, a monitoring environment, it's really important that you can see inside the black box. If you've got a decision that has to be made about consumers and someone might come back one day and say, well, why did you make this decision about this consumer? You're not really in a, you don't want to be in a position where you, all you can say is, well, the machine told us to. The black box analytic that we don't understand told us this was the right thing to do, so that's what we did. Right? Sometimes you can. No one really cares how you detect fraud, for instance, but often 
You need some ways to explain it. If you want business people to use your analytics, they need to be able to understand why the analytic has helped them. So this focus on collaboration and transparency is a big deal in decision management. And it means that decision trees, scorecards, strategy trees, these more visible, understandable kinds of analytics become particularly valuable. Yes, some of these machine learning and neural network techniques are very exciting, and sometimes there are some great use cases. But do not underestimate the value of an explicable model and how important it can be that everybody involved, not just the analytics team, can understand what the model does. All right, last lesson. We live in an era where there is a lot of data, and this means people have to change how they think about using their data. I meet a lot of companies that uh, are really focused on building a 360-degree view of their customers. And they say things like, well, we're almost done. Uh, we've got to find that last puzzle piece. Once we've sorted that last puzzle piece in, we've got to integrate with all the data quality problems solved. Then, and only then, can we start doing our work. Well, this may have been a viable strategy back when there was a limited pool of data, but most organizations today, it's raining puzzle pieces. There's always more data. There is so much data about your customers that they're generating, that you're storing. You have access now analytically to unstructured data, video data, audio data. All of that becomes something you could, in fact, potentially analyze. You can buy data on almost everything. We create far more digital exhaust than we used to. So there's just no way to say, I'm going to pull all that data together before I do anything else. We need a different approach to getting value from this data. We need a way to cut through that perspective, something that will let us focus. And what we have found again and again is that the best way to get value from this data, to identify the data you need and to work with it, is to begin with the decision in mind, to identify the decision or decisions you're trying to improve, and they would be operational ones, to then identify the analytics that will help you. We like to ask the if only question. We show these models to business owners and say, what would help? And they say, well, if only we knew which customers were likely to cancel next month, we could do a better job with the marketing. If only we knew which offer you would accept. If only we knew which suppliers would be late. Well, those questions are analytic questions. Those drive us to start seeing the potential for analytics, which in turn identifies the data we're going to need. Once we know what analytic and what decision is designed to improve, we can go, we can start pulling in the data, and we can start finding the data that's going to make a difference and focus, therefore, on the right subset of all this data. So we can focus not initially on what data do we have and what analytics might we be able to build, but we can go one decision at a time, focusing on the decision that's going to add business value, and working our way backwards to say, this is the analytic we need, and therefore this is the data we need. And we move then from an environment in which we focus primarily on how might we present data for analysis to a new environment where we apply decision management and predictive analytics to be more prescriptive. We start talking about how can we as an organization make decisions with analytics. The five lessons. Focus on the right problem. Focus on operational decision making as the key focus for predictive analytics and decision management. When you build a model, make sure you're focused on how you can deploy that model, not just on what the model is and that you understand what the business results are that you're trying to influence so that you can build a model that will maximize your business results, not just your predictive power. Do not underestimate how important transparency and collaboration can be. Don't just go off and go dark and build a little black box analytic model that's really predictive and feel pleased with yourself. You've got to make sure you engage everybody else. And that fundamentally, if you want to take advantage of all the data you've got and all the data you can get, you have to begin with the decision in mind. You have to start by thinking about what decision am I going to improve, what analytics do I need, and therefore, what data am I analyze. So five lessons. Uh, we see them again and again in companies in every industry of every size. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Tom to show you some stuff about Angus. Tom, over to you. Thank you, James. I'm just going to start up my uh, screen sharing here so that people can see um, what I'm going to be demonstrating. So for this demonstration, I'm going to be showing some highlights of Angos software. Not going to be a detailed demonstration, uh, but it's going to show some highlights of how we can use uh, software or how our clients use our software 
to uh, to support the uh, the points and the lessons uh, described by James. So starting off with the beginning of focusing on the right problem, problem, it's important to have a clear description, understanding what the business objective is for the analysis. So for this particular scenario that I'm going to be showing, it's it's going to be focusing on identifying fraud in credit applications. That is the, going to be the objective. So to show a few a few aspects of what the software can do, I've already uh, created a workflow here where I've imported a data set. And the import is a very simple operation, just getting access to the data, which can come from various sources. Uh, as James has mentioned, we I don't think uh, our clients have um, uh, a lack of data available. There's so many data sources. We can import from various sources. In this particular case, I've imported an Excel file, and I've imported it into a data set. And when I look at this data set, I can, I can verify and ensure that I've got the data that's, a, that's necessary to support uh, the business objective. So in this case, I mentioned the business objective is identifying fraud. I want to make sure that I do have a, a variable that identifies uh, uh, historical cases of fraud. And I want to make sure that I, I have sufficient cases of those. So when I look at the, the data distribution, I can see that there's a distribution of uh, yes and no in terms of uh, fraud cases. So I can con confirm that I do have information available to help identify fraud. I also have other attributes that I'm going to be using as inputs to the model. Uh, so I want to assess those attributes, make sure they do have uh, enough information, enough uh, patterns in them to support the ability to identify and predict fraud. So these variables can range anywhere from behavioral ones, such as uh, uh, the uh, credit history of the, of the consumer, credit usage, if they have overdraft protection, as well as some um, uh, descriptive characteristics in terms of personal status, uh, in terms of uh, type of job they have, and so on. So I get that information available uh, in the data, and I can assess whether this data provides uh, what I need to do to develop the model. One of the key things I want to do um, in this case, I only have I have a, a handful of records about 20 sorry a handful of fields about 21 attributes. I want to identify which are the most important attributes. So if I look at um, my uh, segment viewer here, it helps me to identify which attributes might actually relate to fraud, and I can sort by the information value that's provided in this view, and and look at which attributes are highly likely to to present fraud. I can use this information to identify which are the high-ranking variables and then use those variables in my model development. Now, I don't need to use all the data in, to build a model. I just need to get the right data. So that's what I can do by, by identifying which are the top predictors. In this case, I've already uh, identified those and I have them listed here showing me that there's a handful of variables that are highly likely to be good predictors of fraud. So that's my profiling of the data. The next thing I might want to do is do some additional data preparation. The raw data might not be in the right form that I need to develop the model, so I can do several variable transformations. And those variable transformations can consist of things like binning or calculations uh, or uh, clipping the values or just substituting missing values. So I have the option of doing that through the tool and, and enabling the uh, user to, to derive some additional variables to help in developing the model. In this case, I've created some bin variables that I can see here. And I can explore what those variables look like once I've, I've generated them. So I can go back and explore the distribution of those variables and see, for example, I've got something called equity bin where I can see the distribution of that variable that I've created and some of the other ones that I've created. So I've got my variables and the next step would be to develop the model. Now the model itself, it's a very simple step to, to do, and I can show how uh, just by feeding in the data set I'm working with into the modeling um, a node that I'm working with. In this particular case, I'm using a decision tree. It's a very st straightforward task of taking the data and feeding that into the decision tree. Stepping through the wizard, now I need to identify which is the variable that I'm interested in, in analyzing. In this case, it's credit, risk, uh, credit fraud. And stepping through, I can see I have a few options on how I can develop this model and assessing, again, which variables are going to be important in being able to predict fraud. And I've got those variables identified here. 
And I step through and identify that I want to create a, a decision tree automatically. This is one mechanism we have to create a model. And opening up that view, I can see what the model looks like. So this is where I can start assessing how, uh, how well the model is performing, what kind of results I'm getting from the model, what kind of attributes are, uh, are included in the model to be able to predict fraud cases. And this is part of being able to um, understand and assess uh, the model that I'm, that I'm creating. Another, another step I want to do is do some validation of the model. I want to look at the model in general to see will it be able to identify fraud and looking at some of the statistics associated with determining how well the model can perform. So if I, if I open the, the, our model analyzer view, I can get a view of what kind of lift I would get from the model, how well the model is in identifying fraud. So in this case, I can see that at 50% of the records, I can identify up to 85% of the fraud cases. And that's a pretty good uh, indication that the model is going to be able to identify fraud for me. I can also get information from the ROC chart and get some statistics. So this helps both from a statistical perspective in assessing how well the model behaves, as well as just from a visual perspective of understanding what the model is able to do, how the model is able to be behave and identify the, the cases, of, cases of fraud that I'm interested in and find, finding those patterns. So although I, I've now created the model, as, as James had mentioned, it's not enough to just create an analytical model and create a report that says this is how the model behaves and this is how well it behaves. I also want to be able to deploy the model and do something with this model. In particular, I want to define some actions. And how I can do this is by, by developing a strategy tree. So I'm going to go into this tab that I've identified as called strategy development. And what I, what I can do here is introduce a strategy tree, and with that strategy tree, I'm going to feed it the data set I've, I used for the analysis. And I can introduce some, some key performance indicators in the strategy tree. And the reason I want to do that is so I can see not just the, the probability of fraud occurring, but what are the other attributes, what are the performance variables that are related to the fraud cases? What's happening within those segments that I've identified? So in this case, I'm just going to quickly import a series of key performance indicators. And those key performance indicators can be any calculation I want to create. In this case, I've got some average current balance, some average current uh, credit usage, as well as what the percentage of fraud is. So when I do that and open up my, um, my view for the strategy tree, I can start to see what key performance measures I've got um, within the, the, the main segment. So I can see what the average balance is, $3,271, for example. I'm going to add some quick color queuing here. So as I, as I develop this strategy, I can see what, what's going to be happening. So I'm going to pick the average balance as the, as the measure. And if I start building up my strategy tree here, I can see where um, the average balance is the highest. And I can see the average balance in addition to what the probability of fraud is. So in this, this particular segment that I'm looking at, the probability of fraud is at, at 39%. It's not that high, and the average balance is at three, $3,800. So that might not be um, a, a, significant one, a significant segment I'm interested in, so I might want to split it further. So as I go through, I can start to see that there's this one segment that I've identified that has a, a, a probability of fraud of 62%, and it's a fairly high average balance. So this is a segment I'd be interested in, in identifying targeting. There's some other segments here where maybe the, the probability of fraud isn't as high, but the average balance might be significant enough that I want to do something with it. So this segment here has a 51% chance of being fraudulent, but, but I've got an average balance of $5,000. So I can step through this process and start to determining what actions I want to take. And the way I, I can identify the actions is by simply uh, specifying the treatments to be assigned um, with, within this particular strategy tree. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly jump to a strategy tree that I've, that I've developed and gone through the steps of, of identifying the different strategies. And what we can see here is, and I've identified uh, specific treatments based on a combination of factors, the factors being um, what's the probability of fraud occurring, 
as well as what's what's the 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 risk or what's what's the um, uh, the average balance that would be associated with that, those fraud cases. So I've highlighted these in in three different forms. I've got red as being the priority one cases. So that's a segment that I want to take uh, immediate action on because there's a potential high exposure, the average balance is high, as well as a high risk. The probability of fraud is 73%. Then I have some other segments where I might have a medium risk associated with them. So here's an example where the high, there's a high exposure, over $5,000 in, in average balance, but the probability of fraud is only at 43 44%. So that one would be my second priority actions that I'd want to take. Then I have my third priority actions where the probability of fraud is relatively high. It's at 60, 68%, but then my average balance is, is relatively low. It's only at 4000 So I've been able to identify and go through these segments uh, to determine what actions I'd want to take for, for those particular segments uh, that, I've, that I've created the model on. Now, this particular strategy tree, the, the way this, this strategy tree was created is by using the same um, profile characteristic that was developed in the model. So I'm overlaying that model along with the key performance indicators to get the information I need to be able to determine what actions to take. So I've got that information here. The actions were assigned manually in this case, but it's also possible to assign them automatically via calculations. So for this scenario, I've examined the fraud from the perspective of both risk and exposure and identify three specific levels of priorities as actions that I'd want to take. I can take another view of this and looking at this node report where I can see the list of treatments, my priority one treatments, the first two, my priority two treatments, and my priority three treatments. And they're, they're uh, ranked that way based on my business view of it saying a uh, combination of what the, uh, the exposure is as well as what the risk is for those particular segments. So I was able to do that within the segment tree and, and develop those, uh, those specific, specific actions that I want to take. So that's the first step to, to being able to deploy the model by, by determining what actions to take. So the next step is to actually uh, taking those actions. So how would we do that? Well, we can do that by, by scoring. So we can score directly within the software. So scoring essentially means taking my strategy that I've developed, the same one that I was looking at before. So it has all the, the rules associated uh, with the model that I developed, plus the actions that I've assigned after I've, ex I've assessed the, the, those segments. And then I feed that a data set. And by feeding the data set into uh, a scoring node, what it does is it essentially scores each record based on the rules and the strategies that, uh, that I've identified. And when I look at the results of that scoring, I see that each record gets assigned a particular action. So this, this scoring that I've done within the software, I can take that, I can export that data, I can simply take that and feed it into either a database through an ODVC connection or simply taking a, a text, sending it out to a text file. And by... Uh, identifying which, where to store the information and which attributes I want to keep, I can step through, execute that, and it'll just generate the text file. That text file can then be sent to uh, an operational system for making the decisions. So I've, I've assigned each record with an action. Those actions then could be fed into an operational system so that when that, when that particular uh, record shows up, when that particular customer shows into the system, the action is identified and, and shown to the, uh, to the user. There are other ways of deploying the, uh, the, the strategies that I developed. One way is to generate some code. So I can take, um, I can generate either some SQL code directly from the strategy tree that I've developed, and I can just execute that. And what it does, it creates the, the, the SQL code that I can take and, and deploy that within an operational system to generate, uh, again, the same scores, which are the treatments or the actions I'm going to take for each one of those segments, and use that within an, operation, sorry, an operational system. I can also generate language of SAS code, or I can generate PMML code. Depending on what operational system the user would have, they can decide what language they want to generate this code and take that, that uh, pre-generated code and then feed that into their operational system to generate scores as needed. I've also generated here an example of just generic rules. 
And these are the types of rules that aren't necessarily going to be used uh, within a computerized system, but it's something that can be presented to, to uh, humans so that you can read it and understand what's happening within uh, the rules that were generated. So I get information of, of all the, the, the uh, segments within the, the strategy tree that was created in terms of what are the KPIs that come out of the, uh, the individual segment, as well as what treatments get assigned. So some, some segments have treatments that have been assigned, some of them don't have any treatments assigned, so I get that information presented within these generic rules. So just to summarize what I've been showing, as I said, this is a, a very brief overview of what, what the software is capable of doing, but we were able to do within the single platform, I could access and profile some data, I can build and evaluate a model, and as was mentioned before, it's not enough to just build a model, you want to actually do something with that model. So I could take that model and define and deploy a specific strategy that would leverage the information from the model as well as the business user's uh, insight and, and determining what actions need to be taken. That's, this was all done within the Angular software, and then I could deploy those, those rules into an operational system, either through generating scores within the tool or deploying the actual code that gets generated from the software. The next thing I, I just wanted to mention briefly is what, um, what we're playing in the coming months. So Angular software will be adding uh, some optimization capability to the tool set. What I did so far is I was able to manually identify what segments uh, had what treatments. But if we want to go beyond that, we want to be able to combine several models, we want to create uh, business objectives and constraints, and then automatically optimize the decision-making process and enhancing how we develop these strategies that I was showing. So this new optimizer that will be coming in uh, in a few months will integrate within the Angular software framework and provide some deployment and reporting capabilities beyond what, what's uh, currently available in our software. At this point, I'd like to pass it back to our, our host, Matthew. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. I uh, appreciate that demo. Uh, very well done. Um, Angos is the right combination of software, services, and solutions to fit your organization's unique predictive anal analytics needs from end to end. If you want to do it yourself, we have our Knowledge Seeker, Knowledge Studio, Knowledge Core, and Knowledge Reader software. Of course, Knowledge Studio is where you'll find the strategy trees that Tom demoed today. We can do it with you with our predictive analytics professional services that include consulting, model development, public, private, and on-site training, as well as ongoing support. Or we can do it for you uh, with our collection of knowledge cloud-hosted solutions for the asset management industry, fraud and anomaly detection for insurance claims, as well as lead and opportunity scoring for any industry. Uh, now we'd like to take uh, time to address some of the questions that we've received so far. Um, as a reminder, you can use the Q&A box inside the console to answer your questions. Um, Tom, to begin with, how does Knowledge Studio play with Python and R? Um, one, one, a quick way to answer is we, we do have uh, uh, implemented a node that allows us to integrate with R. So if you have existing uh, R code that you want to leverage and use within this environment, uh, we have that ab ab ability. Essentially, you, you, create the, you add the node into the workflow that I, that I was showing on, on the screen, and you just in, insert your R code there, or you could just type the R code directly into that. So it allows you to integrate uh, with, within the rest of the platform. And then so a, a follow-up that we had from uh, uh, another viewer, or sorry, another attendee. Uh, can you read R data frames or data tables? Uh, yes, there are, there are several formats of data that we can read. R is one of them. We can read um, an R data set. We can also read SAS data sets, SPSS. Uh, we can also read from several databases using ODBC connections. So we have m uh, various means of accessing different forms of data. Um, another question. Uh, in a strategy tree, can you see performance statistic by each treatment? Um, unfortunately, that's a, that's a longer answer, but, but the quick answer is yes. You can generate some, some validation or verification statistics that can, be, that can be explored, and it does provide very detailed. It, it's something that's actually well uh, uh, suited for, for a longer demo that, that we could do for, for anyone that's interested. Um, we can go through more details of how you can present um, uh, the performance uh, statistics on the treatments. Great. Do we have the capability to 
assemble multiple models and sort of combine prediction? Uh, there is a capability to do that. We can. Uh, we have some ability with with our base products to uh, combine uh, various data sets. Ultimately, uh, you would take the model, generate scores, and then combine that. Alternatively, we also have a, a product called Knowledge Core, which provides a lot more uh, I call programming capability. Uh, so that way, you can actually. Uh, do some more complex uh, combinations of models and, and combine them and take averages and, and execute them uh, in, a, in a more sort of sophisticated way. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're going to move forward now. Uh, my thanks to James, Tom, and all of our attendees of our uh, for joining us over the past hour. Uh, I hope you gained some great insight from this webcast. Uh, if you're looking for any further information or have any other questions, you can email us at info at angos.com or call us toll-free at 1-888-687-8838. Uh, after we've concluded, a survey will pop up in your console. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you took the time to fill it out. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will be getting further into the optimization part of prescriptive analytics in September, so keep an eye out for an invitation in August. Uh, we hope you'll join us again then. And once again, a very big thanks to uh, James Taylor and Tom Zugas for their time today. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.